Good evening, everyone. Um, I do hope you can hear me. Uh, welcome to the first Art Unlocked tour of 2024, and thank you for taking the time to join us. Um, I'm Liz Gallimore, I'm a freelance curator, and I do a lot of work at Cannon Hall Museum, which is near Barnsley. Um, Cannon Hall was home to the Spencer and then later the Spencer Stanhope family from the 17th century until just after the Second World War. In 1951, the hall and some of the grounds were sold to the Barnsley Corporation, what later became uh, Barnsley Metropolitan Borough Council. And the decision was made that the building would be a decorative arts museum. For many decades, from the 1950s onwards, the curators acquired wonderful examples of ceramics, glass, metalwork, furniture, and textiles, as well as paintings. More recently, um, portraits of the Spencer and Sanhope families have been gifted back to the museum. Some of these are on display and others are being researched and conserved. The museum has a partnership with the De Morgan collection and the ceramics and paintings of Evelyn and William De Morgan can be seen on the top floor. Um, there is another Art Unlocked tour by Sarah Hardy about the De Morgan collection, which is worth going to if you uh, uh, want to find out more about that. And I'm not particularly going to mention those today. I'm going to talk to you um, about a range of paintings and decorative art objects because it really sums up what Cannon Hall is all about. It has quite a mixed identity, having been a family home and then um, changed its identity into a decorative arts museum, but also retaining some of its period rooms in terms of its style of presentation. So the first portrait I'd like to talk about is Mary Winifred Plain, um, fascinating lady. She married Walter Spencer Stanhope in 1783, and Walter had recently inherited Cannon Hall near Barnsley from his uncle, John Spencer. Walter was actually born Walter Stanhope, um, but he added Spencer to his surname in honour of his uncle, um, a lady he inherited from. Mary Winifred Plain was the daughter of Thomas Babington and Winifred Plain of Carlton Hall in Richmond, North Yorkshire. By the age of 19, she'd actually lost both her parents and Mary had a very significant inheritance. Walter wrote a lot of letters to her during their courtship, which luckily are still in the archives. Um, and he really expresses his deepest devotion for her and a lot of respect for her as well. Um, and he does specifically state that he's not interested in her wealth. He has his own income, his own estates. And it's just really lovely um, the way he talks to her. Walter Neva sent her a pineapple, which was a symbol of, of his love, but her guardian decided it was an inappropriate gift and returned it. Their partnership was highly successful. Mary was very intelligent, very well educated, and she supported Walter's political career when he was an MP. She was an avid supporter of women's right to vote and educated her daughters as well as her sons to a very high standard in maths, classics, as well as music, art and languages. The child in the painting is Walter, who was the eldest of their 15 children. It is recorded that he suffered damage to his spine during birth and suffered from fits throughout his life. He was cared for at Cannon Hall all his life, where he was greatly loved by all of his siblings. He wrote about him with great affection in their letters. It was the next eldest son, John, who inherited Cannon Hall in 1821 on the death of his father. Mary outlived her husband by another 29 years, regularly corresponding with her immediate and extended family. And the portrait is by John Hopner, and there is a companion piece of her husband, Walter, which I'll just find for you. Again, also by John Hopner. And these two were returned to Cannon Hall very kindly by a descendant of the family a few years ago. And it's lovely to have those on display now. Um, Cannon Hall also has a remarkable collection of paintings from the Dutch Golden Age. They were largely collected by a gentleman called William Harvey. He was um, from a family of linen manufacturers in Barnsley. Uh, Jan van Heysen, uh, trained in his father's studio and built a successful career as a flower painter, creating detailed and botanically accurate paintings. Some of these paintings were commissioned by collectors of rare flowers to immortalise their blooms. Van Heysen would sometimes delay a painting until the flower could be captured at its finest when it came into bloom. And there's such beautiful detail in this painting. I don't know how much you can see, but there's beautiful snail and the butterfly on the plinth at the bottom, and everything is so beautifully detailed. The painting was in fact conserved and highlighted in 2021 as part of a national gallery project called Jan van Heysen Visits. 
This project saw a similar painting owned by the National Gallery touring to unusual and unexpected places throughout the UK. One of these locations was an indoor market in Barnsley. The painting owned by Cannon Hall Museum was placed on display in the Cooper Gallery, just five minutes walk away. And the combination of the paintings and the sites was successful in encouraging new audiences to visit the gallery. Um, Cannon Hall also has um, a collection of modern paintings, which not many people are aware of. Um, this is a piece by the artist Sandra Blow, and the image doesn't do it justice. It's about four foot high. It's a remarkable piece, a tour de force. It was created for the exhibition, The Religious Theme, in 1958, which was at the Tate Gallery in London, and it was purchased uh, by the Cannon Hall curators a couple of years later. Sandra Blow studied at St Martin's School of Art and the Academy in Rome, and started teaching at the Royal College of Art in 1961. Many of her paintings included unusual media such as sand and cement to create the texture throughout the surface. And Barnes and Museums is actively collecting the work of women artists to develop their representation in the collections. Barnsley has had a long association with the making of glass, both decorative and functional. Uh, Cannon Hall Museum has a significant collection of glass ranging from Roman to contemporary in date. This decanter is by James Powell and Sons and has a trail of hot glass decorating it, a technique which is often associated with the Powell factory. Powell bought the glass factory based at Whitefriars in London in 1834 and worked with his sons um, to develop all sorts of different designs, uh, but he also worked with a lot of arts and crafts designers such as Philip Webb, and he worked a lot with Liberty of London making glass for their pewter range, which was known as Tudric. Um, it was often um, mounted with pewter. Um, and the factory later became known as Whitefriars, and that's where you might know the name from, and you might be more familiar with the 1950s, 60s, sort of very strong decorated pieces um, from that period. Cannon Hall also has a really extensive um, ceramics collection, about 860 odd pieces, um, about a third of which are on display, obviously we can't manage to get everything out. Um, and I really love this piece because it's a crossover between the fine and the decorative arts. Um, it's actually by John Piper, who is obviously a fine artist and best known for his architecture of the country house and its landscape. Like many artists, he experimented with painting onto ceramics. Um, this was actually bought from an exhibition of Piper's ceramics at the Dan Klein Gallery in London in 1982. Piper has taken the view from an architectural treatise, treatise entitled Grotesque Architecture for Rural Amusement by William Wright, first published in the 18th century. The view shows a rounded hut with a pointed roof in a landscape setting. It's described in the book as an elevation of a hermit's cell with rustic seats attached. And it's actually written on the back as well. Piper's actually um, cited where he's used the source from and he's painted that on the back as well. Um, the shape of the piece is just purely decorative. It's not something you'd ever particularly use functionally, um, but there is a wonderful crossover in the collections between these fine and decorative artists and particularly, particularly people like Therese Lesore. Um, we have some lovely ceramics painted by her as well. Um, we have a very strong collection of furniture, um, but unfortunately, like a lot of furniture bought in the 1950s, 60s, 70s through um, retail, through auctions, you lose a lot of the provenance, which can be difficult in terms of attributing back to particular makers. The joy of ceramics is it's in most cases, it's written on the base, who's done it or stamped or impressed. And with glass as well, it's often quite easy to figure out the factory. Furniture can be much more difficult. Now, Thomas Chippendale is a seminal name in the history of furniture making, um, and it would be lovely to attribute this piece to him. It has all the stylistic hallmarks, it has the quality of making, but we don't have any archival or paperwork um, evidence for that, so that is a real shame, but perhaps something with more research, we could attribute this to him slightly more strongly. It was designed as a dressing table in effect. So the top drawer actually pulls out. You have a, a, a base slide on it where you would use for brushing furniture, brushing furniture for brushing your clothes. And then you would slide that open and you'd have lots of compartments and you'd have a mirror and you'd sit in front of it and you'd have your, your wig and your powders and you'd get yourself sorted, ready to go out. 
the interesting thing about furniture is um, to do with the woods. Many of the woods um, of the 18th century, particularly mahoganies, came from the Americas. And this really does open up an interesting discussion about what's happening with global trade in this period. This trade obviously involved enslaved people, which the Spencer Stanhope family were partially involved with. Benjamin Spencer was the young son of William Spencer, who owned Cannon Hall in the earlier part of the 18th century. Benjamin sought to make his fortune by buying a ship, which he named the Cannon Hall. However, its journey in 1755 resulted in the death of 58 people and the enslavement of a further 34. A generation later, Walter Spencer Stanhope inherited the hall. And now interestingly, he was a close friend and supporter of the abolition, abolitionist William Wilberforce, who was a frequent visitor to Cannon Hall. So it's so interesting within a generation that the political um, landscape of the hall has changed. Um, so Cannon Hall really is an interesting place from that point of view. Um, I've just shown you a few different um, objects from the collection. Uh, we have a fascinating range of paintings right from the family portraits, which are starting to come back to the hall, which is really, really good. And the exhibition a few years ago on um, the family portraits was incredibly popular and it allowed us to spend some time researching the family history. Um, We've had some more portraits recently, which is good, and they are um, some of the more of the women of the family. So again, we're looking forward to spending some more time researching those right through to the Dutch collections, which are really, really fascinating and worth, worth visiting for. Um, right through to the Decorative of Arts. And it's a very interesting place to visit and it's, some, it's a place that's going to have an interesting future over the next few years. We are looking at how we're going to present Cannon Hall because you come in and you come in traditionally to a country house into an entrance hall but then as you work navigate through the rooms you go through different spaces you go through spaces that have traditional um, cases with decorative arts in and then you go into an area like the ballroom which was added in 1891 um, which is a sort of Victorian version of a Jacobean room. And then you go along the South Front where we have Georgian rooms, which are period rooms in the terms of their setup, but they are um, furniture, ceramics, glass that have been bought in from the 1950s onwards. And it's difficult to explain to people that actually these aren't the objects that the family had when they lived here. And we have this constant contradiction between um, what, how the family used the hall and how it's presented now. And then as you move around the hall, you get more rooms in terms of get a lovely glass collection. We've got the oak bedroom, which is full of arts and crafts furniture, which is worth visiting. And then if you go up to the top section, we have the De Morgan rooms. Um, the reason of the connection with the De Morgan is that Evelyn Pickering, as she was before she married, was actually a niece of Walter Spencer Stan, so Walter Spencer Stanhope, who owned Cannon Hall in the 19th century. So we have this contradictory um, view of Cannon Hall and, and navigating your way around it, and it's not a particularly satisfactory route. So it's something we really want to work hard on over the next few years in terms of presenting the hall, finding out what people are interested in. Do they want more family history? Do they want more in terms of period room setup? Do they prefer the more traditional museum, everything in cases? Um, so we're working on a big consultation next year in terms of how this is going to work out. So that's kind of my introduction. I'm very happy to um, take some questions. It looks like there's a few up there already. If anybody else wants to add to those, I will um, um, look at those as well. So thank you for your time. Um, I do hope you've enjoyed it and I do hope you do find time to come visit us at Thank you.